the subject fathers, sons, and the Holy Spirit. Fathers, sons, and the Holy Spirit. I, I am trying to distill. I'm a European apostle. I'm, I want to speak to you as a European apostle. I go by pastor, but really, God announced me to my wife as an apostle. By the way, let me tell you that story before I settle down. Before I arrived at university campus, God announced me to my wife to be. There's a boy coming. <laughs> Pastor, me, I didn't kneel and beg and say, my wife, do you, would you remotely consider the possibility? <laughs> I did not beg. The Lord had mercy on me. Announced me before I arrived. So there's a guy coming. He's called Kassidye. That's the name I grew up being called. Seranga is a, something the Indians decided was easier to pronounce. My Indian teachers, so they, they in Konkaski, yes, Katwanga. <laughs> so that's how I became Seranga, but I'm really Kassidye. And the Lord announced me by my mother's voice in terms of the name that I was called at home. Kassidye! There's a boy called Cassidy coming. And God said to her, he shall be your husband. And I will use him for apostolic ministry. Wow. So, you know, here we are trying to fit ourselves into pastoral titles, but God declares us apostles while bibs are around our necks. He says, you're an apostle to the nations. Now we are understanding it's got nothing to do with temperament. Whether you have apostolic temperament, God has an apostolic mandate over your life, whether you know what to do or not. Each one of us has a sense of sentness, and when you discover it, you lengthen your life. We need to find our sentness, wherever you start from. So, it was so easy for, 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 for me to, to get a yes from my wife because the Lord has go, had gone ahead of me. And so when I finally proposed to her, I'm thinking I'm breaking news. She said, I've been waiting for you for three years. Watching me going around in circles. Thankfully, I wasn't doing girls. I was just so busy doing kingdom. The reason some people can't find their wives is their wavelengths is clouded with too many girls. Suzanne, Jackie, Hope. And your brain is overwhelmed. Sorry, I'm not meant to go there. <laughs> yeah, so you need to come back offline. Sometimes when your internet gets stuck, you switch it off. You switch it back on and it clears. Okay, I'm not supposed to go there. <laughs> but I think somebody is looking for their wife here. Fathers, sons, and the Holy Spirit. You see, one of the keys to breaking into Europe is going back to ancient paths and finding where the good way is and walking in it. And I don't know how well you are doing. I worship harvest. Some people are watching us online. One of the critical elements of the missionary discipleship movement, I'll tell you, the story of Liberty Christian Fellowship is a story of failed sonships. Like Pastor said, failed sonships. So you stand and God ordains you to be a father and you don't even know how to father because you are an orphan yourself. And then you are producing these multiple orphans and the whole church is full of orphans, rebels, and vagabond. <laughs> and it ceases to matter how long you have been at it. So, allow me to accelerate. But um, in the distill of everything, the moment I, I read... Um, uh, Doug Mills' book on loyalty and disloyalty, I knew something was about to happen. <laughs> it's one of the first things. I, I read the book and thought, just like you said, I thought, what is this book about? 
I can't even put the word loyalty out of my mouth. I find it too difficult a word. So I tried to run away from the word loyalty and I went into the word honor. I thought that was more portable and easier to sell to Europe. How do you talk about loyalty in Europe? So I want to tell you, friends, one of the battles we are going to fight is the battle of orphans and rebels and vagabonds and teachables because this, the Western culture is fed on individuality, is built on rebellion. And I don't know whether we have recovered fully even as Ugandans because I don't know any country as rebellious as Uganda. I don't know whether you've beaten this thing out of us. Followership is at the heart of the, this revival. Everybody say followership. Hmm? <laughs> yeah. So allow me to bring some thoughts on followership and then I'll get out of your face. Followership. Because when I've read and listened, it's, the, it's what rings. And at Liberty, I have hardly done anything else. I've not taught much of Mike Breen because followership came from somewhere else and was injected much stronger into this mix. And to me, I feel unless that conversation is done, we can't move to others. I want to convince you in the next few moments that followership is at the very heart of missional discipleship. So, Father, help me. Give me speed and precision to speak your words to these people. Amen. Amen. I want to show you first that followership is not an accessory in our Christian doctrine. It is central. It is central because it doesn't start when discipleship starts 2,000 years ago. It goes back through history and actually begins in the Godhead. The Godhead is constructed around the principle of followership. Father, Son, Spirit is the, actually the miracle <laughs> of reality. God is a family. <laughs> God is a community. Father, Son, and Spirit. What's their dynamic? Their dynamic is followership. And so we are introduced in the Bible, Genesis chapter 1. In the beginning, God created heaven and earth. And we know what it reads like. Darkness was upon the face of the earth. God is already speaking revelation to us. And the spirit moved over the water and did nothing. Almighty Holy Spirit, with the capacity to populate the earth in an instant, did nothing but hover and wait because the Spirit follows the Son and the Son follows the Father. Just because you can do it does not mean you should do it. Do you understand? So the Godhead, Father, Son, and Spirit, now doctrinally we say, the Father, Son, and Spirit are co-equal and co-eternal. You guys are doctrine, doctrinally savvy. Co-equal. The Spirit is God. The Son is God. The Father is God. They are co-equal in divinity. Yet the Spirit can only hover and wait. <laughs> he waits. Because once there's more than one unit in the room, followership must kick in. Who creates the initiative? And who falls in line to create oneness? The oneness of the Godhead is not by democratic vote. It's by subjection and submission. Voluntary. Are you with me? So the oneness of the Godhead is not by glue. It's not that they are glued together. It's not because of some democratic vote. Each one is a person 
The Father is a person. The Son is a person. The Spirit is a person. They are not manifestations. Don't get your doctrine wrong. The Trinity is not God manifesting as the Father and then let me manifest. No, no. There are three persons. They are co-equal and co-eternal. Yet, Jesus says the Father is greater than I. And the Spirit will do nothing except he hears the, the Son say it. So followership is the first revelation of Genesis 1. And here's Pastor Lincoln trying to grow a church with rebels. And everything is a vote. Guys, what do you think? And we've learned to, to, to nurture and cultivate individualism. <laughs> it is so quiet in the first church of ice, cube, ice cubes. Hmm? You are trying to catch up. I was shocked. I have been shocked to find how fundamental this is. Until you put it in place, you labor in vain. You are buying time. Are you ready for me? <laughs> the spirit of the Lord is hovering. He's like... I can do this, but it does nothing until God says, let there be. Then it springs into action. He is impotent until he is moved. By choice, by the way, it's by choice. Don't think the Holy Spirit cannot. Hmm? I tell you, as a pastor for over 30 years, the issues, the story of our life as a church is a story of obedience and rebellion. That's it. The summary. The afflictions of a pastor are in the boardroom of rebellion and submission. Followership and non-followership. Loyalty and disloyalty. The story, when I show you the growth, 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 uh, growth curve of LCF, the troughs and the peaks, at every trough there's a rebellion. There's disloyalty. Brother, brother, brother T is moving when he should be standing. <laughs> People are being too clever. So, I am at the feet of the Lord saying, Lord, change something. God, give me speed. I need, I need to hurry up. <laughs> so, Genesis 1 to the Spirit does absolutely nothing. Creation is waiting. Angels are holding their breath. Nothing happens. Until the Father speaks. Fathers, sons, Holy Spirit. So let me, let me preempt you where I'm going. The Holy Spirit has always worked in a scenario and the presence of a father and a son. That's what he's conversant with. That's what he understands. So when he's poured out on earth, he's poured out on the presupposition that is falling upon fathers and sons. The environment he is familiar with is an environment of order. <laughs> so when he, he falls upon orphans and vagabonds, chaos ensues. There's nothing as dangerous as anointing a fool. Because you then get an anointed fool. And the rest, <laughs> the rest is problems. But by the way, have you noticed in the Godhead, in heaven, there are only two thrones? 
Father, Son. Where's the throne of the Holy Spirit? The Holy Spirit has no throne. Yet he's equal with God, but his role is not to sit, it is to move. So there's no thrones for him. He must bathe creation with the presence of God. He must, such, he must execute the works of the Father and the Son. So there's no thrones for him. Poor Holy Spirit hovers constantly, even today is hovering. He cannot sit and enjoy the majesty of worship. We can say, Holy Spirit, uh, <laughs> we, <laughs> we, worship, we worship you and we honor. He's saying, come on, can we get on with something here? What, direct your worship to Father and Son. Me, I'm an executor. I'm not saying don't worship the Holy Spirit, but he's not so impressed with your worship. He wants to get on with work. He doesn't sit around. And so, he, he by nature, eternally past, is a mover. Huh? He must, so, uh, potentially, God knows, you know, I, I, don't know if, I don't want to become philosophical, but there always has been the possibility of a physical creation even before it was. And so there's got to be an aspect of God which is exportable. So we only need two thrones. We need, an, we need a God who moves and sits in your kitchen and in your bedroom and in your bathroom and, and is in your heart and in your kitchen and your pots and your pans and your glasses and is in the grass and everywhere. So God is that. And that part of him is called the helper. The Holy Spirit. And the word is is, a, is, a, is that Greek or Hebrew? Is a helper. Helper. Uh, do you know another helper, by the way? Yeah. Women. Woman. Women who sit are a contradiction. Let me tell you. tell you women are not created to sit you are created to move when I arrive when we arrive with my wife at home I always go and sit she does not sit she goes to the kitchen she goes everywhere she's the wind she's wind that blows through the home Hey, hey. She's the wind that blows through that house. And the, uh, this is not my sermon, but. Uh, <laughs> a woman must understand she's the power of the house. The Holy Spirit is the power of God. Yeah, you are not the head, but you are the power. When your, wife has, when your wife, as a woman, when you don't anoint your husband, he is not anointed. You, you need to get to know the Holy Spirit because your role and his role are so similar. They are so similar. You need to... When a church is... If a woman, the women of a church are dry... That church is dry indeed. Yeah. I really believe that women carry a mysterious role in the kingdom of God. In co-partnering with the Holy Spirit and his movements. Yeah. Can we talk about Eve for two seconds? Because it's ahead. So, God intentionally... God intentionally does not create Eve at the beginning. He creates Adam and he gives instructions to Adam. 
and Eve is not there. Because even in creation, followership is embedded right there. Because Adam must now turn and instruct Eve. And Eve must follow Adam. Do you understand that even in creation, followership must be embedded? And so, Adam must learn to bless and empower his wife. So God speaks to him in her absence, then he emerges her and watches to see whether he'll instruct her in the thing God wants them to do. And when the fall of man happens, Satan bypasses Adam and has a conversation with Eve. What is he doing? He's disrupting followership. So the fall of man was not just the eating of the fruit. It was the disruption of the order of followership. Do you understand? We fell from a deep place. From the Garden of Eden, we are trying to remember how to follow. And when a woman does not know how to navigate the difference between however strong you are as a woman... Your husband may be a couch potato who just sits around and does nothing but is your head. And it's a mystery. It's a mystery. Because somehow, <laughs> somehow, uh, she, you as a woman must follow your husband. The Bible says wives submit to your husbands. How can I submit to a fool? Well, you married him. where we start. <laughs> hmm? Somehow, you've got to learn how to bring your energy into that house without disrupting the flow of followership. And to energize him. Everything the Holy Spirit does, the wife must do. You must fill him with your presence. Remind him, the Bible says, he shall remind you, he shall bear witness. My wife must bear witness over things that I'm doing. And every time I've tried to leave her behind and try and, you try and bully your wife, I'm the head of this house. Head of, you are a fool because she must bear witness. Like the spirit bears witness. He must remind you. The spirit reminds us of the things God has taught us. My wife reminds me. She witnesses to me. She anoints me. She energizes me. And she fills me. Are you there, friends? <laughs> so, so the fall of man, friends, was a fall from followership into this culture of independence. And our marriages are dying because Bob marries Sue. The limousine is parked outside. The suits are dangerous. The bridal gowns are amazing. But the two people standing at the altar are individualists. The only thing they will exchange are rings. Hmm? And God is saying the two shall become one flesh. What is the formula of oneness? Followership. The Father, the Son, the Spirit. The Spirit does nothing unless He hears the Son say it. Can I talk about the Trinity? Take your seats. We need to talk about the Trinity a little deeper. Can we go a little deeper about the Trinity? <laughs> can, can I show you you know from the scriptures the father the son and the spirit blow your mind because listen to what Jesus says let me find where I am in, the, in my notes because I, I've, I've, I'm all over the place I first showed you the spirit does nothing Jesus said I will send you another one just like me 
And he will not speak in his own authority. He will take what I say and reveal it to you. <laughs> A spirit will not teach on his own authority. So, you see, friends, we lost something divine. We lost this dependency on somebody else's influence. We lost it. It's not natural for us to default. Huh? So the Holy Spirit does not have his own identity. His identity is Christ. The Bible calls him the Spirit of Jesus. And then when, when Jesus talks the Father, the Father, the Father, the Father, point comes to a point. Point comes when Philip says, you know, Jesus, show us the Father. We just show us the Father, that will sort us out. And Pete, Jesus says to him, Peter, Philip, you've been with me all this time and you don't know. Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. Each one defaults to the other. The Spirit points to the Son, the Son points to the Father. And just when you think you have arrived at the Father, the Father says, Behold my Son. And the cycle starts again. When you go to behold the son, and the son says, I will send you another helper, and the side, and you are bouncing around the Trinity because none of them is self obsessed. And the father has a right to be self obsessed and to sit up there and say, ha, ha, I'm the leader of the universe. Send the glory. He is constantly giving glory away. Behold the son. Listen to my son. That's my son. I'm pleased with him. Listen to him. He constantly points to the son. And the son sends you to the Holy Spirit. And the Spirit sends you to the son. And the son sends you to the father. And it's a cycle of glory stewardship. Hmm? The only way to keep the glory of God is to give it away. Was that too, too, too deep? For you to catch. It starts in the Godhead. The father points to the son. The son points to the spirit. The spirit points back to the son. The son points to the father. And just when you think you've arrived. Do you think God is sitting there saying. Worship me. Worship me. <laughs> you think God is some kind of insecure maniac. Sitting in heaven. When the Bible says he seeks for worshippers, we think he's sitting there like an alcoholic waiting for a shot. When we worship harvest, worship so that I feel good about me. You know, when the worshipper worships God, God gives him glory. Have you noticed? Everything you call God, he calls you. You tell him you're amazing, he says you're amazing. You tell him you're wonderful, he says you are wonderful. He cycles it back. Only maniacs keep glory. Only madmen. Don't you ever touch glory. Give it back. Give it back. Get rid of it. Get rid of it. Get rid of it. It's not meant to be a static product. It's meant to be dynamic. So you give it to God in worship... And you give it to your followers in commissioning. Ay, 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 ay. Did you catch that? We give God glory upwards in worship. And we give it to our disciples by sending them. And sharing power with them. Share, share, share. That's what's wrong with the church. Can we talk? See, when God calls Abraham out of, out of the Chaldeans, he's breaking him out of a system. He is already a father. The word Abraham means exalted father. You see, God was speaking to me, Pastor, as we've, uh, Apostle, as we've, as we've listened to you and listened to Morithi and listened to, to um, Mike Brin. You listen and say, God, what's going on? Then you begin to see it throughout scripture. So Abraham is a father, exalted father. That's the problem. 
He is an exalted father. Fatherhood is not for exaltation. It's meant to be for reproduction. It's meant to be for multiplication. So exalted father is a barren state. You are there, you are big, you are magnanimous, you are positioned and respected, but you are a barren father. You are an exalted father, so your name is on leaflets and flyers and websites. But there are no children in the earth. <laughs> Shall we take a break? There are no children. I tell you, we've done Abraham. Most churches are Abrahamic. They have an exalted father up here in the lights. And his briefcase is carried and his suits are by Pierre Cardin. <laughs> and those names. But God looks in heaven and says, you barren lot. The lot of you. And at his best, he produces Ishmael. When he pushes hard, he produces Ishmael. Hmm? And then you wonder why they are killing us in our churches. Ishmaels. They are not sons of promise. They are not sons of promise. And God is saying to Abraham, get out of that system. Get out of that structure. Get out of that system that is, what did we call it, client Provide a setting. Get out of that system. Uproot yourself. I know you are 75 years old. But uproot yourself out of that system. Disentangle yourself from whatever benefits it has given you. So Abraham has to liquidate everything. And start again at 75 and start a journey afresh, dwelling in tents, looking for a city whose builder and maker is God. Do you understand the challenge we have with Europe? Not just Europe, but churches around. I have tried to get pastors' attention. I'm telling them, guys, we have to stop this consumerist stuff. We've got to stop this glamour. We need, like Abraham, to uproot out of these structures and start a journey. Go back to tents. Dance to the drumbeat of somebody half your age if you have to. Relearn, church. And when you go to Genesis 15, Abraham has been following God for about, what, 15 years? He already started at 75. Now he's 90. And the Lord shows up and he says, Abraham, I'm your great and exceeding Great reward. <laughs> Abraham saying, Lord, I'm, <laughs> I'm continuing childless. Continuing childless. What will you give me? And God says, nah. He says, the layers of the Damascus shall be my heir. He says, nah. I do not want fabricated inheritances. Hmm? I wonder... You see, these churches, when you hear, oh, so-and-so, he's done, he's passing the ministry to his son, you, we think that the, 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 the presence of God, God goes down biological lines. Sometimes it doesn't. And these are models being exported to us by Western community societies saying, train your child to take over from you. In what way are you training him? He, does he have your genetics? Has he ever followed you even? Do you understand? And so, Abraham is contesting. God is saying, one out of your loins shall be your heir. Because the spirit of God will not settle unless he sees a father and a son. Do you have that diagram that I sent you, my love? The one which has triangles. Show these guys. I drew this thing. So, there are three H's here. Father, son, spirit. Head, heir, Helper. That's the, under, that's the environment the Holy Spirit understands. But you see the, the blueness of the Spirit. He, is, he has this attachment thing waiting to touch another structure. He, what is in heaven must be manifested on earth. 
And so, move to the next level. So, the first miracle is the creation of fatherhood. And you see, Pastor Angie, it was Pastor Philip. Philip. You guys call him Filter. On one of the days you didn't come, you sent us Filter. Pastor Filter asks us, and we are pastors. Some of us, I think, are 10 years older than him. I pity these guys. They convene us, and some of us, are, we are old enough to be their fathers and their our mentors. What a shock. <laughs> so Filter asks us, pastors, what is the key to discipleship? And we begin to roll off from our experience of 30 years of pastoring, 20 years. And Filter listens to us. <laughs> and there's nothing as difficult as being asked what is discipleship you think what is it after we had all talked Pastor Filter said brethren, pastors what changed us at worship harvest is one thing we found out discipleship is about spiritual parenting I almost fell out of my chair <laughs> you know, you've heard it, you've read it, but truth keeps impacting you until your brain finally submits and says, you know what? I have heard this truth too many times. That day, my head opened up and I realized I have never been a father at LCF. I have been senior pastor, anointed man of God, prophetic teacher, all that stuff, carry his briefcase, move his car for him, give him priority at dinner time. But you are Abram, you are a barren patriarch. And you need a miracle to happen for you to become a father. Do you understand? I am telling you as a father, I'm telling you as a pastor who's pastored 30 years, many of our pastors are Abrams. Exalted, they can preach you to heaven and back, but they cannot beget. At best, we create Ishmael's. So, the spirit comes to create heads. So, Malachi prophesies, prophesies I'm going free flow now. Malachi prophesies. He says, I shall send the prophet. This is God signing up the old covenant, signing out of the old covenant. I will send you the prophet Elijah. And he shall turn the hearts of the fathers to the children. And the children to the fathers, lest I smite the earth with a curse. That is how God signs out of the Old Testament. He's saying, I'm getting out of this system myself. It doesn't work. And I'll tell you, after 30 years of pastoring, it does not work. Attractional Christianity, when we put on shows, hmm? wear fancy suits, and try and, and keep the brethren happy. People shop for their churches. Oh, I don't like this one because of the Sunday school. Who told you it's about liking God can send you to a church with nothing there and say, that's your station. It's not about window shopping. It's about God ordaining your spiritual family and you need to identify your spiritual father and fall into line. Because the spirit of, of God is looking for father-son dynamics. Go back to that triangle, my brother. You see, Head, air. The son is the heir of all things. The spirit is the helper. Now he wants to replicate that on earth so he must turn the hearts of the fathers to the sons. That's the first miracle. You must resign from Abram, break out of all of the Chaldeans, and start a tent journey. Searching for a city whose builder and maker is God. And on that day, Pastor Filter, when we finished the call, I said, oh my God, I've raised the house of orphans. And they call you, Papa, Papa, Papa. You, know, you guys, your, your sheep call you Papa. 
And this papaness has got no fatherhood in it. Hmm? They are orphans. <laughs> they only follow you when they agree with you. When they disagree, they go their own way. Uh huh. They find another papa. And the papa! We had one. All my days, I won't say the name. That girl would papa us. She papas you until you feel like, oh my God, I really am papa. Then a prophet comes to town. You don't see her for three weeks, for four weeks, because she has found another one. And by the time she comes back, she's in debt. You need to pay her rent. You need to pay her. Because she gave all the money away at that crusade. You guys know exactly what I'm talking about. <laughs> what a shock indeed. But the first miracle is Pastor Lincoln's heart turning to LCF and connecting with an Abrahamic rebirth. And I remember I stood at Liberty Christian Fellowship and said, guys, I am your father. Even saying it, I felt like a huge bomb fell. This man right here, Kafiro stand up. This is the first man who said to me, when I stood, and you say, when you're saying it, you feel so illegitimate. When you're trying to bring your fatherhood to the house. This man told me, you are my father. The very, you don't, you don't, you, I don't know whether you remember. You were the first voice that responded to me to say, and this guy is not an easy one to father. He's not an easy one. And I knew it, in this whole transition, I'm going to have trouble from Kafero. He was the first one who said, you are my father. I follow you. And I said, eh, eh. Kumbe. Fatherhood can happen. So give it up for, give it up for Stephen. <laughs> Please take your seats. Uh, do I have 10 more minutes? And I get out of here. And people wept in church. And there, there are those you look at hand, you also say, now that one comes to church, bless the Lord. But you don't know how to resolve that relationship. And those are the very ones I sought out. You are my daughter. Today I've begotten you. Today I've begotten you. Because it starts on a particular day. And you can only do your part. After you have begotten them, now they must papa you properly. But the father's heart must turn, turn first. And in some cases, that handshake may not work. But I've now told LCF, if I'm not your father, go find your father. Because I will not tolerate rebels or orphans in the house. I have played enough games. And I need a city saved. So that thing which flaps is called a door. Hmm? What are we? We say, so, do you know this one? If you don't like our pastor, if you don't like our worship team, if you don't like the pastor's wife, If you don't like this message, give it up for Jesus. Yeah. The problem is when you try to fill every seat anyway, you end up with the house of rebels. No identity, no destiny. And so, this followership has got to be grinded back into the house by its sovereign divine process because after the hearts of the fathers turn to the sons and the hearts of the sons must turn to 
the fathers. Yeah? Take to that next slide. Boom. Now we're talking inheritance. Inherit. Do you know most of the blessings of the church are an inheritance? Healing is an inheritance. Prosperity is an inheritance. And so when Abraham lays hands on Ishmael, God just stands back and says, when is the circus finishing? I'll carry on from here. <laughs> Do you guys understand what we are dealing with? So God says to us in Isaiah 20 verse 30, though I give you the bread of affliction, your teachers will not be hidden. That is Isaiah. Can you find that for us? Isaiah 20 verse 30. 30, sorry. 30 verse 20. The other way around. 30 verse 20. Though I give you the bread of affliction. Is that right? Yeah. And though the Lord gives you the bread of adversity and the water of affliction, yet your teachers will not be moved into a corner anymore, but your eyes shall see your teachers. It's nothing like suffer, nothing as bad as suffering and being ignorant at the same time. I don't mind suffering as long as my teachers are clear. And my darkest time in the journey of 30 years of pastoring is where is my bread? Where are my instructors? Where are my fathers? And I found books and videos. And I followed, followed, followed until God says, okay, now I'm moving you to another teacher. Thank God in this time, my school is missional discipleship. That's my school. I will not shift left or right. I feel like finally I've found a buffet. Have you ever been to a buffet? Walked around the table and nothing appetizes you. <laughs> Have you also gone to a buffet where you want everything? And your plate, you wish your plate could expand. <laughs> oh my God. Oh my God. When we found worship harvest, we found a table laid. You know, it's one thing to have the food. When will you peel and boil and bake? When somebody peels and bakes for you and lays a table, you just need a plate and time. And an appetite and a belly big enough. So my towering instructor is this man right here. In this season. Up more. Uh, he's my, my, I may be going through trouble right now. And you can understand with all the dearth and the desert that we've walked through. There are so many issues. COVID came and knocked the ball out of the park for us. We lost our building. The kind of bills that London is. We got an electric bill one time of what? 19,000 pounds sterling after COVID. Three months, 19,000 pounds sterling. I said, Jehovah God Almighty, how are we getting out of this mess? That is Europe for you. That is the United Kingdom. We got energy surveyors. They looked at the building. Where's the electricity going? But God was saying, I'm getting you out of the Isle of the Chaldeans. These buildings. We had a 21 square foot, 21,000 square foot building. All the businesses ran out. They left us there. When we reopened, only 70 believers returned. Everyone else was tired of shopping. I said, God, where do we go? The hand of God said, but I felt God was saying, Lincoln, if you sleep through this moment and keep this church here, you will all die in this building. <laughs> so I told the brethren, we are out of here. 
We are back to tents. But I knew this was the moment because I've tried to shift this church from consumer Christianity into missional discipleship. And each time it was difficult. But now I saw the ingredients clearly. They stood out clearly. I said, this is the moment. We need to get this church on another footing. And it is not, first of all, about paying expensive buildings. I told them we are out of this church and we are replanting LCF on missional discipleship grounds. If you don't like it, that flapping thing is called the door. We rebuild from scratch. And so missional discipleship was born at LCF. Hmm? But my instructors are there. We would not have coped with the amount of change and transition that we've needed except our teachers are clear. So I tell you, all we do is read books, watch videos, listen to podcasts, <laughs> and run home and install change, install change, install change. Teach, reteach. I wish I had time. Can, can I conclude this? One minute. Guys, fathers, sons, and the Holy Spirit. This is the order of God. The Spirit comes to anoint fathers and their sons. Not rebels and orphans. Thank you, Jesus. So, what is involved in sonship? What is involved? Let me touch a couple of ideas and close this. Matthew 18, 3. Jesus said, Surely, surely, verily, verily. Matthew 18, 3. Verily, verily, I say to you, unless you are converted, unless you are converted, and become as little children, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. <laughs> this is the miracle of sonship. A conversion. You come to Christ, then you come to sonship. Each one is a miracle. Getting converted to Christ will take you to heaven. Being converted to sonship makes you a movement creator. Makes you part of a spiritual family. And this is the problem. We thought believers would build movements. They build nothing. They give you temporary, temporary um, full, um, occupation of chairs. They can't build nothing. Converts. Jesus loves them. Their name is written in the book of life. But now you need another altar call. That those that are saved may be converted to, to, to sonship. Because being born again makes you a child of God, but being converted, the second conversion is what makes you a son. There's a difference between childhood and sonship. Hello, am I going? You guys, I can see you are brain tired now. Yeah, because the Greek word is technon for child and huios for son. They're two different words. Technons don't build nothing. They just go to heaven and cause chaos on earth. <laughs> but it is Huios, the sun. Those are the ones that build the kingdom of heaven. Because the spirit rests on them. And God builds a household out of it. Now we can create a movement. And I tell you, Pastor Lincoln can pack a sermon anytime. You wake me up at midnight and say, ready, steady, go. I'll preach the cockroaches out of the house. But can I build a movement? That's why I'm listening to 33-year-olds. Because this is not about sermonizing. It's not about whether you can sing and the chords are right. Can you build a movement? Can you build a house? By the way, you worship others. Are you a house? Are you following your pastor or are you bothering him? It's too late, Uganda. The Nigerians are way far ahead of us. 
We need to catch up. And may, may God find it. May God find Uganda worthy. <laughs> for this time. For us as Ugandans to do our part in world history. And may we resign from this madness that typifies churches. I am slightly ashamed of the kind of rubbish we host. I can't go into names. That's not culture. There is too much rubbish in the earth that is slowing us. So we need to accelerate. Sonship. Somebody say sonship. sonship. Yeah. So you find whenever the Holy Spirit find father son stuff, bang, things break out. Can we talk a little as I close on this? Yes. Because I want you to now look again at some stories. And now you understand, ah, now that makes sense. Do you know on the Mount of Transfiguration, there's a meeting of three? Who are they? Moses, Elijah, Jesus. Do you know, strictly speaking, those are the only three people who managed to create actual sons on earth? This is a meeting of fathers. You go read history. Did Samuel create a, pro, a, a son? The sons of Samuel were vagabonds and rebels. Anointed, but domestically, there are issues. You can be very anointed and create orphans all around the earth. And you can never create anything significant. And this is the trouble. <laughs> we have these big churches. I went to a place in Uganda and found a large cathedral. And we were waiting for Bishop. Bishop came out walking like this, full of arthritis. Full of arthritis. He's in his 70s. Not, not a son in that house. He had gone to America, wherever, preached, brought bricks and bought until he built this amazing cathedral. By the time he finished the cathedral, everybody had left except women and children. Because he, he was Abram. He has never made a disciple. <laughs> never made a disciple. So Moses, thank God, creates Joshua. How? Joshua runs into the tent of meeting every time he sees his father going to pray. He also goes. The Bible says, Israel will get up and everyone will stand at his tent and look at Moses. Do you remember the Bible? Yeah. They would look at him from a distance and admire his prayer life from a distance. But Joshua would run into the tent and pray under the shadow of his father's anointing. And so, by the time Moses is gain, going to die, we have a successor, not in name, but in spirit. Yeah, and you read it in the Bible. I wish I could find it. Yeah. The Lord said to Moses, this is Numbers 27, verse 18. Let's have that. Let's, let's read it. I want you to see, you are not invited on the mountain of transfiguration except you transferred your grace and your anointing to somebody else. And Moses said, and the Lord said to Moses, take Joshua, the son of Nun. This is before he dies with you. A man in whom the spirit is. And lay your hand on him. How did the, Joshua receive the spirit and no one else did? The others were at a distance. Consumer Christianity. Pastor, get anointed. Stretch your hand here. In fact, throw your jacket <laughs> this is the kind of believer we've created. They are all jacket catchers, but they catch nothing else. And it's a temporary thing where you fall on the ground and go, sk, 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 sk. and when you get up, you're as dry, if not drier. Huh? <laughs> but Moses would follow, I mean, Joshua would follow Moses into the prayer mountain. And the Bible says when Moses would leave, he would stay there. Because there was a lingering thing. Yes. And he would go probably and stand where Moses was and pretend he was Moses. 
I tell you, friends, it is imitation. It is submission. It is pursuit. And so now God is testifying of him. He's saying he already has the spirit. Now lay hands on him. Go to the next verse. Set him before Eliezer the priest and before all the congregation and inaugurate him in their sight. Next verse. And you shall give him some of your authority that all the congregation of Israel may be obedient. Hmm? So, by the time Moses dies and God says to Joshua, arise, my servant has died. There's already a, a legacy of pursuit. So, there are two types of, of followership. There's passive followership and active followership. Passive followership is where you respond to the drive of your leader. They say, do this and you do it. But active followership is when you decide. I'm going to chase after him. Elijah's Elisha style. Because Elisha, and I'm, ru I'm running quickly. <laughs> Elisha chases after Elijah. After that initial calling where he drops a mantle on him, the Bible says he chased after him and poured water on his hands. And when Elijah is about to be taken, he keeps telling Elijah, stay here. Telling Elisha, stay here. The Lord has sent me to Bethel. Stay here, the Lord. And he's trying to shake him off. Because you see, in fathering, we need to give people a way of escape. If you don't want to follow me, exit. And he keeps shaking him off. Stay here. God has, and Elijah, Elisha says, as the Lord liveth, I shall not leave you. I shall not leave you. And you're going to come, we are going to come to points as disciples where you say, should I continue following this man of God? <laughs> and God is going to orchestrate difficult situations and bring tough assignments to decide whether you're ready to follow. Beyond comfort. And give you ways of escape. Elisha says, I will not leave you. Three times he says, I will not leave you. And then a point comes and Elijah breaks into a run. And Elisha chases after him. And then he strikes the water and the water divides. This is when you say, ah, yeah, 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 yeah. Flooding issues are getting involved. The guy smites the water. The water divides. He's chasing. And Elisha says, I'm coming after. Beyond troublesome, you are taking us into dangerous territory, but we are chasing after you. So when he crosses the water and the water closes behind him, now they are looking at each other. <laughs> He says, what do you want? Why don't you leave me alone? <laughs> he says, I want a double portion of what you carry. Did you notice the, the other sons of the prophets were, were in their camps? And they had this revelation. Do you know the Lord will take your master today? Partial revelation. Eh? They don't know that's not the point. He is going, yes, but there's a mantle to collect. Yeah? And so we end up with too many institutionalized children. They, they sit in centers and they have a curriculum. <laughs> huh? But there's one that pursues beyond convenience. And you see the temptation... Is Elijah says to Elisha, stay here. Join these guys. And as a follower, you need to understand you're going to be given offers eh, to stop your pursuit. And I get offers. He was, Join us here. Stop here. And you say, guys, I am my... Uh, Elisha was not content to be part of an institution. Oh, I'm in the choir. It's not enough. I must download and steward my, what my pastor carries. This was Elisha's pursuit. I want the double portion, which was the right of the firstborn. And Elijah tells him, this is a hard one, what you want. Because it's easier to produce Ishmael 
than to push Isaac out. And Sarah bails out of it and sends in Hagar. And says, this thing is too hard. Let's take a shortcut and create Bichupuri children. Fake children. They stand, they hold the mic. They look right on camera, but something's off. <laughs> Understand? Am I still your friend? Yeah. You are holding the mic, but something is off because you are one of the, you see, sons of the prophets. Do you notice the plurality there? Sons of the prophets. They carry the spirit of the prophets, plural. No, we want the spirit of Elijah. This is specific and personal. Where does movement come from? Not in generalities. This movement is a specific thing. So we, we don't want to just look like the prophets, which is what it means to be sons of the prophets. Sons of prophets means you look like the prophets. You are like the prophets. No, I want the spirit of Elijah. That was the bid. And I want to close with this idea. Elijah told him, what you have asked is hard. Because we're talking about fathers, sons, and uh, you guys help me. I know you are tired. And the point I'm making you to friends, there are stewardships of God's power and grace that only fall upon sons and daughters. That's the point. And we have not been doing that. Something different. Because he says to him, now that is hard. Not even I can guarantee that, guarantee that to you. But... If you see me <laughs> being carried off when I'm taken, then it will be yours. What does that mean? The very same thing with Joshua. Because you see, unless you participate in the spiritual transitions of your spiritual parent, in the encounters, position yourself where they are looking in the face of God and you are there as well. You are there. You don't dodge prayer meetings. Don't dodge troubled times. Don't dodge difficult moments. And you, you move away from institutionalized following. Or oh, did you hear what the pastor said? Hey, me, I also heard him. Oh, well, can you know, it together? And you get into the popular gossip and the shallowness of church life. Yeah. separate yourself from the sons of the prophets and chase after this thing. When everybody has gone home, you are still there. <laughs> Elijah cannot manage it for him. And I've seen pastors smearing people with oil, catch it, take it, no amount of oil, even if you baptize them in a tank of oil. Nothing can substitute true followership. I went to a crusade by Maurice Cerullo in, in Earl's Court. This was at the very beginning of our church. And I watched that man minister, Maurice Cerullo. And it was like I was the only person in that building. Because you see, crowds can all follow. But you must follow. Hmm? And I remember a day he stood and the power of God fell on Al's court. I'm talking about what's the capacity of Al's court arena. I don't even remember. 10,000? My God, I don't know what was going on. He was like a tiny little spot at the front. The power of God fell everywhere in that arena. And I thought, my God, I want this. I want this. And he would say, I have no control on what's going on here. <laughs> oh my God. I said, Lord, give me something Maurice Cerullo carries. And then he said that day, I'm going to anoint everybody in this room. <laughs> and you see, this is a problem. Sometimes 
The best we take away is oil, oily faces. Sometimes all you get is oil. And nothing else. But I knew when I got up from ice and we were in a large queue and he was there just going like this. Too many people filing past. And some would come and go off with an oily face. As I came, I was still 10 meters away. The closer I got to him, the more impossible it was to stand. Because it's about hunger and pursuit. And before I got to him, bang, the power of God hit me. I was carried past him. I was yesterday's, I was like, I just, I just remember feeling touched. I am a chaser. I don't know about you. So me, I'm going to chase you and I'm going to overtake you if you are a time waster. I am chasing after something. I want to see the glory of God in my days. Something came into my life. Then there's a, a woman of God who came to London and preached. Again, God humbles you because sometimes he hides things in very weird places. And you have to bend down double to catch it. If you are up here and too important, you'll never catch it. God, uh, this woman preached and my spirit was bursting because I felt, I want that. Because naturally, Pastor Lincoln is a structured, didactic, stiff teacher. If you had found me in my early days, I would stand in one spot, open my Bible, and give you five points. But God has had to break this vessel. And I don't know where I am or what I am. If you look at me, you will see Maurice Cerullo. You will see anyone that has ever been anointed. I am a gathering. Sometimes I feel, these days I feel Mukisa in me. I'm saying, Mukisa, what are you doing in me? Because, you see, I must catch everything about everybody that makes sense. I see Michael Chaze. I see, I carry anointings. I am a sponge. <laughs> I'm an anointing catcher. I better be. You better be. But I went to this woman. I told her before you leave this country because I felt there was something about her anointing that I needed to catch. I told her, you need to lay hands on, on me and my wife and anoint us. And she had no oil. I told her, touch your tongue and anoint me with your saliva. Because there's no other fluid in, in sight. Are you ready to catch something? Yes. Europe is waiting for us. <laughs> Europe is waiting for us. Stand to your feet, followers.